Good morning. Welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church, United Church of Christ here in Oak Park, Illinois on this March 14th, the fourth Sunday of Lent. My name is Reverend Gloria Cox. I'm the associate pastor here, and we are delighted that you have chosen to join us this morning. We are an open and affirming diverse and inclusive congregation that is on a journey to understand how God is still speaking to us today and to discern our call and the best way to answer that. Like all journeys, it is best done with companions and in community, and therefore we are especially pleased to have you joining us today. Welcome and thanks for coming. Good morning. My name is Carol Bustamante, and I am proud and delighted to be your liturgist this morning. I don't know if you're logged in and watching for the first time, 
or if you're logged in and watching for the 54th time. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you may be home alone and feeling lonely. What does matter is that you realize that you dwell in the heart of the Creator and that the Creator dwells in yours. And God's heart never runs out of love for us. So don't be shy and don't hesitate to tell folks how that feels. How you are never really alone. Will you please ready yourself for the opening prayer? Creator God, we are so thrilled to be followers of Jesus. There has never been, nor will there ever be, anyone quite like him. You filled your beloved son to the brim with your love. He shared this intimate relationship he enjoyed with you, thereby leading us out of darkness and into the light. And now we do the same for one another by telling our stories about our relationship with the Creator. Let us draw others to the light by sharing how we were before and how we are now. Now please join Joycelyn Fowler, Mary Leger, and Nancy Miller in singing the opening hymn, How Can I Keep From Singing? Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Holy and all-powerful God, who commands all spirits, comforts those in distress, and casts out destructive forces, we confess that we are unable to do your will. We protect what is familiar and reject what is unknown. We admire those with courage, but excuse ourselves when we falter from the truth. We forget that you are always with us and that with you all things are possible. Forgive us, lead us, make us new. Remove our desire to heed false prophets and show us your way. Amen. And now, my sisters and brothers, hear the good news. The God who made you and knows your every thought hears you now and forgives all your sin. You have been redeemed through Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, who is Alpha and Omega, all in all. Hallelujah. Amen.
true. Peace and blessings, pilgrim. Peace be with you. Peace, pilgrim. Good boy. Peace from um, Charlie, Daisy, and Tuna. And Tuna is currently walking away. Uh, Good morning, fellow pilgrims. Peace be with you today. Love always. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with the pilgrim people. Peace, peace and love. love. Peace be with you. Our reading from the Hebrew scriptures today is Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3 and 17 to 22. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their inequities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sunday, Pilgrim. I am so grateful to be on this Lenten journey with you. As you can see from our map here, we're about halfway through our journey to the cross and to the resurrection. We've gone through 22 of the 40 days and we're on our fourth Sunday of Lent. So today we're talking about a scripture that's pretty familiar to everyone. It's John 3.16, and it looks like this, but we're going to do it in a little special way with a scripture cheer this morning. So I'll do it first, and then we'll all do it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believed in him will not die, but live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. All right, let me hear you. Are you ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believed in him will not die, but live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. That was awesome. Thanks for joining in with me on that. But following that famous familiar scripture, there's some more to the story that talks about light and dark. Now, I want you to imagine you're in a totally dark room. Either close your eyes or cover them or maybe put a blanket over your head so you can really see what darkness is like. Now, what happens when you're in darkness? Well, you might bump into something, so that would be hurtful because you can't see where you're going. Or you might be scared or sad because of being in the darkness. Well, the scripture talks about how in our everyday life, sometimes we feel like we're walking in darkness. And it hurts us, makes us sad, and makes us scared sometimes. But the scripture reminds us, just like it did in that for God so loved the world scripture at the beginning that the promise is, is that Jesus will always be with us in the lightness and the darkness. Well, what gives us that light in our lives? Why, God's love, of course, gives us that light. It shines through us, out into the world, and we give it to others. So God calls us in this scripture 
to be the light in the world, to share God's love and to shine our lights as bright as we can. Let us pray. Dear God, your love shines through us for all the world to see. Help us to share your love so that no one is in the dark about you. Thank you for your son who is the light of the world. Amen. Our second scripture reading comes from the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is a word of the Lord for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Well, I, I think we can end the sermon right here. Delina, you can turn this off. There's nothing really more to say. Is there? I mean, this is the best summary we can come up with, right? You don't meet, need me to interpret. We all know what this verse means. We know it so well, don't we? Last week, I gave a sermon about re-examining our expectations for our lives and for the church. The pandemic, as you know, has changed everything about our lives. And so I wonder what we want to keep about the present what we will let go of as we make our way to a new, a new normal that will not and cannot be the same, cannot be the old normal. I talked about our need to be open. I think it's fair to say that we have expectations for Scripture, too. We think we know what it means especially a passage like this one. And so today becomes sort of the first hurdle for us as we try to come to this text with fresh eyes and with openness. Because the truth is, this passage is so well known by most of us. And that's kind of a problem. Even if we're happy to claim a certain kind of biblical illiteracy, we still know this verse. We see it printed on advertisements on the side of the highway. It's in every end zone of every football game after the touchdown is scored. It's on placards. It's, it's even on protester signs as they march through our nation's capital. It's so popular that to be born again is associated with a certain type of political stance, a theology, a culture, a way in which someone moves through the world. We don't even need the words, frankly, because we've turned this text into a slogan. John 3.16, that's all I have to say. And like a flashing neon sign right in your face, 
Well, we assume all these things. Or maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself here because that's certainly what I do. So, let's back up. Let's begin again. Perhaps we can make more sense of this text than the sad cliche it has become. Let's see what happens. As I read these verses, I noticed that there were really two sections. Verses 14 and 15, and then 16 through 21. The first two verses tell us the what. We learn that the Son of Man, that's a title for Jesus, we learn that the Son of Man must be lifted up. It is a physical lifting as well as a metaphorical one. It is a foreshadowing of the crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension. And because of all this, it is an ultimate exaltation too. Now, in the Gospel of John, you might miss this, but one of the things he does is that he condenses these distinct movements of death, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. He condenses all those things down, which happen over a period of 50 days, into one clean movement. It's a single event that moves seamlessly from one moment to the next. There can be no crown of victory without the crown of thorns. No resurrection without first a death. No ascension into heaven without first then a descent into hell. Because Jesus is lifted up, gives his life, we have new life. Make no mistake, the irony and double entendre are crystal clear here. And yet, the cross and exaltation are mysterious in their inner workings. Theologians have debated and will continue to do so precisely how this works. The way in which the cross brings us new life isn't really the point of this passage and certainly not of this sermon. In verse 15, we are told that we receive eternal life. Now I know when we read the word eternal, we automatically jump to this bright sunny day in heaven. You've got the white puffy clouds. You're lounging about with God and the angels and maybe you've got a fancy cocktail in one hand and of course all the people you love are there and you're singing and clapping and there are no tears and all the rest of it and whatever else you've got up there in your brain about heaven, that's what the word eternal means. But that is not what we mean when we say eternal. That is not the fullness of the word Eternal is not just someday in the future after we die. It's a very short-sighted view of Christian eschatology. Eternal, as one commentator put it, is a life lived in the unending presence of God. Eternal life starts today, right here right now. The life we receive through Jesus is the actual life you are living today. Your life matters. Your choices matter. Your love matters. One of the things we have tragically abused this text, one of the ways we have tragically abused this text is that we have turned this into some slogan for a personal spiritual experience of conversion that really only matters after I die. This 
has the effect of making your life today, well, sort of boring, if you think about it. And not only boring, but more problematic, frankly, kind of irrelevant. It has the effect of lowering our view of this life. <laughs> Such a diminishment is not what God intended at all. Eternal life is new life lived in its fullness and flourishing today. Really. This is why we struggle for justice and equality and compassion and mercy. That's why as people of faith, we believe we are called to do something about the structures of racism in our society and immigration reform and affordable housing in Oak Park and climate change and access to clean water and LGBTQ equality. Because this life, your life, as you are living it today, matters. Faith doesn't take us out of this world by promising some fairy tale about the future by and by. Faith grounds us squarely in the realities of our present world because we believe that God's presence meets us here and now and in fact always will be with us even in the shadow of our death and what lies beyond. It is both and. It is not either or. So, this is the what. Verses 16 through 17 tell us the why. Why does Jesus come? Why does Jesus take on our human life with all of its difficulties, limitations, pain? Why would God do such a thing? If I were God, I would not. I just have to be honest. I would not. And so I wonder why God does. For God so loved the world... When you stop and think about it, isn't the whole story of Scripture really about God's love for creation and for us as humans created in God's own image? From the Exodus to the prophets to the words of Jesus to the stories of the early church, there's this one grand narrative all aimed at one thing. Love. It's really quite simple, actually, when you think about it. I believe that God, in God's nature, in the very depths of who God is, is love itself. Now, some folks will want to argue with me there. They'll say, what about justice? What about judgment? <laughs> the truth is, I don't think God would create all that is, go through it all, use all this wonderful creativity, create so many beautiful things and people just to create a world, a place in which God could judge us. I don't think God is like that, and I don't want you to think that God is like that. That sounds like something we humans try to do to one another. It doesn't sound like God to me. Love is why Jesus comes. Love is why God keeps chasing us and wooing us. Love is why grace continues to unfold in our lives in these mysterious and profound and small and simple ways. Because we are loved. Because we are created to be in relationship with God, who is love itself, and therefore we come to love other things, other people, rightly. 
Two years ago, I led a group of adults down south on a civil rights trip. We visited Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, a tiny little red brick church that literally stands in the shadow of this blindingly white, alabaster white, Alabama Capitol building. Martin Luther King Jr. was called to pastor that church in 1954. I was surprised to learn that his first week in the pulpit, King preached on John 3.16. God's love has breath, he said. It is a big love. It is a broad love. God's love is too big to be limited to our particular race. It is too big to be wrapped up in a particularistic garment. It is too great to be encompassed by any single nation. God is a universal God. That first Sunday, King told a different story of the God of this verse than the one we might be expecting to hear about, the one we think this verse is talking about. He leaned into it as a source of justice and action, a theology that said, this life matters. He goes on, this unlimited love has been a ray of hope and given a sense of belonging to the hundreds of disinherited people who proclaim like the enslaved preacher who risked everything to teach his enslaved congregants in the shadows of the plantation, you ain't no slave, but you're God's child. For God so loved the world. This is a love that sets us free. Free to be who we were always created to be. Free from fear. Free to act. Free to serve. Free to live. We love because he first loved us. The Apostle John writes, We love because God loves us first. Don't deceive yourself. Everything that we do that has love in it is simply an echo of a deeper love that was already active and present. We love because God and Jesus the Son, present from the foundation of the world, have set love in motion, have enabled us to love, to participate with their creative love here in the one place and time that we can choose in the midst of life itself. May this life, may this love be yours. In the name of the triune God, amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord give thanks. Hold your thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord give thanks, holy thanks to the Lord for 
to join me in prayer. You are welcome to share your prayer joys and concerns online during this service in the chat, remembering that those will be viewable by the public. Alternatively, you can submit prayers privately through our website or contact a deacon for healing prayer by phone. Today's re prayer is responsive. When I say, Lord, hear our prayer, I invite you to respond and in your love answer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, be our guide on this journey of Lent. Open our ears to hear your words of challenge and your words of grace. Open our hearts to love all that you would have us love, our families, our friends, our neighbors, our enemies, strangers in our midst, this beautiful planet that is our home, and all living things. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for those dear to us and all those we've come to lean on as we mark the one year anniversary of this global pandemic. We pray for those who are struggling in isolation or frustration, for all those who experience illness or pain in body, mind, or spirit, for all who have lost someone or something central to their lives and have to cope with grief and loss. May all these, your children, know your grace and mercy. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. We pray for peace and safety in the world, for countries struggling to care for their citizens and to rebuild their economies, for all who do not receive the respect and consideration they deserve, for all those persecuted for their faith or their views, for all who are disenfranchised and long to live in freedom. May all these, your children, know your grace and mercy. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray, O oh Lord, for those in our family, our church, our community, and our world that you bring to our hearts and minds at this time, and we hold them up to you. We ask for prayers of encouragement, comfort, and grace, for those who are coping with the stress and grief of change, for all seeking new employment, for the family of Alice Mirsek, 
a long-time friend from Austin Boulevard Christian Church. We pray for justice. We ask that police departments can be reformed and accountable and that our justice system be infused with your grace and mercy. We offer prayers of gratitude for Mary, Kathy, and others who recently have been vaccinated for the increasing availability of COVID-19 vaccines, for the American Rescue Package, which will provide needed financial resources for the many families, cities, and states that have been significantly negatively impacted by the pandemic. For Kathy's sister, Nyla, whose birthday was Friday, for Jane Ann's remarkable life as we celebrate her 90th birthday. We pray for these dear ones who are close to our hearts that we lift up to you now, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. May all these, your children, know your grace and mercy. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. We pray for the concerns of our hearts this day, for the fears and frustrations we struggle with, for any troubled relationships, for the doubts and the hopes which compete within us, for any need of healing and support. May we, your children, know your grace and mercy. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. Loving God, help us stay focused on your love. The fact that you loved us so much that you came to be one of us. That you do not keep removed from us, but walk beside us and dwell within us. Our creator, our Redeemer, our hope. We thank you and praise you for creating every day infinite new opportunities for us to love you and love our neighbor and see your face in everyone we meet. Fill us with your spirit that we may widen the circle until all the world knows your grace. We pray these and all things in the name of Christ who taught us to pray together each in the words most familiar to us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread, a deadly bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time in our service when we offer to God a portion of what God has given to us. You are invited to give to Pilgrim Congregational Church using any of the four following methods. One, Go online to www.pilgrimoakpark.org, select Giving from the menu, or click the Give to Pilgrim button. Two, via the Tithely app, which you can get from your phone's app store. Three, text the word GIVE to 833-721-1098, or just mail a check. At this time, we ask that you give as generously as you are able.
Make no mistake, Lord, we know we are blessed. We know you keep your promises. We know you have never left us, nor will you ever leave us. So let us enjoy a huge sigh of relief as we bask in the security of your love. Help us to go out and bring that security to others. Use our gifts, Lord, to serve others. And now as we come to the close of our service, I have several announcements to share with you today. A quick reminder that all of this information can be found on our website and also to check out the What's Happening at Pilgrim email that comes out on Thursday. And now I want to remind you that the Pilgrim Anti-Racism Be Bold group has drafted an anti-racism pledge. Pilgrim members and friends are encouraged to read it, pray about it, its intent, and consider signing it as a personal commitment. More information and the pledge itself can be found on the front page of our website. The SCORE, that's Sacred Conversations on Race Committee, is organizing a white caucus group, which is a group model for white people to do their own internal work to prepare for becoming more effective allies for racial justice and change. The group size will be limited to eight members. Karen Grimes and Kirsten Peachy will facilitate a five session discussion of the book, Practice Showing Up, a Guidebook for White People Working for Racial Justice by Jordana Peacock. The group's discussions will be held on five Sundays in April and May, beginning April 18th, and the time of day will be based on the schedules of the participants. Please email Karen Grimes for more information. All are invited to register to attend the two-part workshop, Anti-Polarization, Communicating Against, uh, excuse me, Anti-Polarization, Communicating Across Divides of Culture, Religion, and Politics on Saturday morning, March 20th and March 27th. Registration is required, and for more details on the workshop, as well as to register, see our, workshop, our, our website. Also on March 20th, from 9 to 1230, the Be Bold Criminal Justice Group will be meeting virtually with others to discuss policing issues and what direction the police accountability team of the Community Renewal Society should take. Please contact Jane Baraby if you're interested in joining them. Please support Pilgrim Nursery School by joining in the Pizza Kit Fundraiser from Sugar Beets. Just pre-order by March 24th. Pick up your order here at Pilgrim on March 25th, and then join in a virtual pizza making party that evening. All of the details can be found on our website. And next Sunday morning, you are invited to join us at 9 a.m. for Adult Enrichment, when we'll welcome Reverend Dr. Marilyn Pagan Banks to share some of her poems from the words of her mouth, Psalms for the Struggle. More information on this collection of ancient psalms which have been brought into a modern context and the Zoom link can be found on our website. Immediately following today's service, everyone is invited to join us for a brief time of fellowship on Zoom. Hi, my name is Colin and I'm the senior pastor of this church. If you are a visitor or you regularly watch this service on YouTube, uh, but you don't consider yourself to be a part of Pilgrim Congregational Church, I want you to know you're in good company. Uh, because the truth of the matter is, is that I started 11 months ago, and I'm a visitor, a new person too. So I'm inviting you to join me to a newcomer's uh, virtual gathering. We'll be having this gathering in a couple of weeks. This is an opportunity for you to find out more about who Pilgrim Congregational Church is, our ethos, the theology, our history, what it means to be a pilgrim. You'll get to meet me uh, and hear my vision for our church. 
and you'll get to meet other very talented and committed lay leaders in our community as uh, we welcome you to consider becoming a member and becoming more invested in the life of our church. So if you are interested in joining this virtual newcomers event, then I invite you to email me. You'll see my email address at the bottom of your screen now. And just let me know you're interested. Thank you so much. And now please join Janine Bergen in singing the closing hymn, Amazing Grace. Good morning. I'd like to invite everyone at home to please join us in singing uh, three verses of a hymn that has given many people uh, a source of inspiration and hope and comfort for many years, Amazing Grace. So we'll sing three verses. And now, my sisters and brothers, receive this benediction. May the God of love guide you and lead you. May this love bubble up within you. May it set you free, free to serve, free to live. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.
Thank you.